Should we study film music in the same way we study classical music? This is one of those questions where some will strongly say yes and others strongly say no. Considering we currently only study classical music, I want to take a look at how film music is viewed by some and also explore the potential advantages of studying film music. I'm also going to compare a few things to what I was taught in university and grad school as well, so it's possible your education would be different. Considering there is a lot of ground to cover, I divided it up into sections, but I will upload a complete version as well. Probably the biggest comment I hear about film music is that these composers quote, steal classical work, so it's not original. By extension, this means that we study this rep already. First, about the stealing, I made a video about how all music is a remix, but the short version is that while there are examples of movie soundtracks sounding very similar to classical pieces, it's most likely because the director wanted the music to be similar to the temp tracks. This argument also ignores the fact that the composers quote, steal music all the time. Starting with the earliest form of polyphony with Leonin and Periton, using existing music as their cantus firmus. And composers since have used both past material and reused their own work. So these film composers aren't doing anything that composers have never done before. If you also consider the total number of film music songs out there compared to how many similarities have been found to past music, that's a very, very small portion. A big example that shows how low this type of music is viewed for some musicians is a comment about video game music. Slightly off topic, but related. I won't say the group or conductor I was with, but the comment was this. Have you noticed all video game music is the same four tempos? My immediate response in my head was, not if you go the right tempos, especially since it was very clear the conductor didn't know the music. This is easily proven by looking at some of the top video game music. Looking at the iconic menu themes from a single series, we get Smash Melee at 154 BPM. Let's take a look at a single game as well. Mario Kart 8 has 48 tracks, plus a menu theme, course intro, and credits. How many different tempo markings do you think there are? Considering this is a racing game, you'd expect all to be upbeat and somewhat similar. Here's my chart of all their tempos. Not even close to four, and ranging from 98, or 112 if you don't want to include the course intro music, to 208. Yes, the tempo fluctuates on these tracks, so this chart is only the average tempo from the first few bars. The mentality that all video game music is the same four tempos is the same as me saying all classical music is the same four tempos. It does not make any sense whatsoever. Anyway, that's just one real world example of the mentality that musicians might have. So let's take a look at another. An individual, who I will not name, asked the question, why? Why perform movies live? Here are the arguments given, but these are common among those against the idea I'm exploring here, so it's worth going through. This argument suggests we only see movies once. There are plenty of people that weren't even born yet, so they couldn't experience some of these movies, like Star Wars, in theaters. Now they have that chance with a live orchestra. 
Plus, an argument pressed in schools is for students to go hear live concerts as the experience is so much different than listening to the piece in your bedroom. The same applies here. I would also ask the question in response, do you only listen to a classical work only once? Are the audience for a concert only there because they have never heard the works on that concert before? Why are they there in the first place when they could just listen to them at home for free? I was scheduled to play Tchaikovsky 5 three times in one season. I've played the Firebird twice in one season, Sibelius 2 twice in a season. This argument doesn't make any sense. If the problem is that film soundtracks are being performed over and over again, so are the classical works. Even if you want to show that Star Wars was done 30 times in the US alone, I'm sure you could find that Beethoven 5 was performed more often. Another argument that doesn't make any sense. This is true for operas as well as some symphonies where the low brass doesn't play until the last movement. In Beethoven 9, the trombones play for maybe 20 bars in the second movement and then not again until the end of the fourth movement. So if the argument is that we shouldn't perform movies live because the orchestra sits for two hours and only playing 30 minutes, then we shouldn't perform Beethoven 9 at all. While on Beethoven, let's nix the fifth symphony too. Trombones only play in the last movement. While I'm fully aware the 30 minute number was most likely not meant to be accurate, I will still pose the challenge. Find me a soundtrack of a movie performed live that is only 30 minutes of music. I think the longest break between cues from movies I've done is about 5 minutes. And to really show the craziness of that 30 minutes number, in E.T., the final chunk of music is about 20 minutes of non-stop playing. Less than a quarter of that is the credits. But I'm sure the other hour and a half of the movie has only 10 minutes of music total. Just by looking up the soundtrack for any of these movies shows over an hour of music. And remember that this isn't everything from the movie. For Star Wars, there exist two CD sets. And there's also full soundtracks for the Lord of the Rings movies, hitting over three hours of music for each movie. My initial response was that the repetitiveness is no different than that of Wagner. But if this person says it proves their point, then let's go deeper. Classical composers wrote rondos. And this rondo by Mozart is fairly well known, but it's super repetitive. What about composers that wrote in sonata rondo form? Those repeat melodies all over the place. Some concerti have an exposition, then a development where ideas from the exposition are then taken and altered before coming to the recapitulation where everything is pretty much repeated in its original form. Isn't that a bit repetitive? Star Wars themes have been greatly documented, no one greater than Frank Lehman. If we take one of the more iconic motives from Star Wars, how many times would you say it appears in the films? This short iconic horn solo that appears probably more than anything else appears about 18 times in the original 1977 movie. While this sounds like a lot, let's compare that to the Ode to Joy theme from the last movement of Beethoven 9. How many times does that theme play in this 20 minute movement? It's played 9 times, mostly in the first 10 minutes of the movement. So this short motive from Star Wars is done 18 times in 2 hours, but the very long theme is done 9 times in 20 minutes. That's more repetitive, if you ask me. I really want to know where this argument comes from. It again does not make any sense. More and more orchestras are adding in a film series to their seasons. Originally these concerts were tours, not unlike the Symphony of the Goddess, Pokemon Evolution, Video Games Live, Game of Thrones, etc. But now more orchestras are performing them on their own and growing. I've been hired to perform a movie soundtrack live and more performances were added due to high ticket sales. But you know, the novelty has worn off. I will be fair and say that I have been hired to do a movie soundtrack with three performances scheduled, but two of them have been cancelled. So this does happen too, however, it's still very well attended in comparison to the classical concerts. This comment is a very purist comment. Orchestras should only perform classical symphonies only, anything else is degrading. And if you think that's a stretch for me to make... 
How does performing a movie live do our craft a disservice? Our jobs as musicians are to perform and entertain an audience. Of course, a movie soundtrack to audience will be different than a classical audience, but isn't that a good thing? You are expanding your services to more people. This is like saying I will only perform symphonies between 1800 and 1900. That doesn't make any sense. Now, it's true that musicians will take certain concerts off because they don't care for the rep being performed, and that's 100% okay. What's not okay is saying the orchestra as a whole should never perform certain music. But believe it or not, some people, like this person, is okay with some movie music. This person just proved a major part of society that I feel we all need to be aware of. Each time a new thing comes out, kids love it and the adults hate it. It's the old cliche of, back when I was your age. Seriously, music from the 60s was compared to devil music. Generations are usually just old people talking about snack about young people, and when we look at the history of talking about generations in this country, it's the same story over and over again. Here's a famous Life Magazine article about the baby boomers from 1968, and the, the writer said, even as I said it, I knew the phrase, to make a living could have absolutely no meaning to these children of the affluent society. This is an article from 1985 worrying that the new generation was becoming self-obsessed because they were were filming themselves on their brand new mobile devices, right? Uh, 1990, 20-something, laid back, late blooming, or just lost, complaining that Gen Xers are entitled and don't want to work for a living, all the way up to this Time Magazine piece of sh from 2013. Which, by the way, this is clearly a ripoff of the Tom Wolf article from 1976. Like, there, it's a direct quote of it. Good luck finding many people today saying that the Beatles were not a major influence of popular music. Yet, if you ask the adults from the 60s, that two-beat pattern is the music brought to the United States of America by the communist conspiracy to corrupt teenagers, and it's in every rock and roll number. The obscenity and vulgarity of the rock and roll music. I was informed about a concert experience where the orchestra performing the movie live was placed in full darkness and mixed well with the movie. So the experience was like going to a theater with a great sound system. This does indeed take away from the live orchestra to a degree. I believe the orchestra should be mixed a little higher than normal too. An idea to remedy this problem could be to place cameras around the orchestra and shown on a screen to the side, highlighting certain sections during big moments. This places some more attention back on the orchestra. I will admit this was not my idea, but I really like it. This comment can be taken two ways, so let's address both. First, we have the general idea that no film music was intended to be performed live. This part is not true. Depending on the composer, movie, and when the composer is brought on for the film, there might actually be music written for concert performances early on. Several John Williams movie scores had suites written for them, like Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone, with its nine-part suite. Certain themes can also be written, like the prologue to Hook or the theme to Jurassic Park that don't actually appear in the movie. This isn't true for all movies, of course. Danny Elfman is the easiest example, where he makes a mock-up for a demo to send to the director. Then it's orchestrated and sent into the studio. But Elfman doesn't conduct his own movies. He stays in the booth where you hear what the audience is going to hear. This means he approaches it with the idea that it will be for the home or theater viewing only, and not a live performance, since it will sound different. What about the second part? That's the idea that the movie soundtracks as a whole were never meant to be performed live. This is absolutely true. They never were for the most part once the talkies hit in the 1930s, and required hours upon hours to edit and set up to be able to be performed live. From the streamer program, as well as mixing in certain electronic music that won't be performed live, to writing additional music in two cases that I'm aware of, but to me, this is a poor reason as to why we shouldn't perform them live. Some movies will certainly be difficult to be done, but so are certain operas and symphonies that we perform all the time. Let me know if I missed any common views against film music. As you might imagine, this topic really fascinates me.